today we're going to be taking a look at skew tees, hodographs, that sort of thing. Just because we've had a few requests for this, you know, we have a very, very basic 101 intro to hodographs. We also have a very 101 basic intro to skew tees, and we have a more advanced uh, lesson on hodographs taught by Cameron Nixon. Great, great, great guest lesson. But we don't have anything that really bridges the gap and explains some of these concepts in a little more detail. So that's what this is going to be. It's going to really kind of own in on that kind of advanced beginner to intermediate. You know, that was a terrible way to say that. But basically, like, if you're heading into the intermediate area, this lesson's for you. Okay, and in this part, we're going to explain all the different pieces of what you're seeing here. Uh, just a quick refresher from Intro to Skew Tees. This uh, area is really what we focus on, this left box area, with the red line being the temperature, the green line is the dew point, this dashed line is your most unstable air parcel, at least I'm pretty sure that's what it is uh, on COD. Uh, the cyan line right here is the wet bulb. You also see this dashed pink line, that is your actual temperature of your downdraft too. So some cool stuff here. Uh, to uh, look at, but we're not going to really delve into dive into this. This is more thermodynamics and such. We're going to kind of ignore that for this video. What we're focusing on this video are the winds, which are right over here. These are the wind barbs with height. Uh, you can see here at the surface, we're at 1,000 millibars. You have the surface wind speed, and then you go all the way up in the upper atmosphere. These are all winds with height. Now these winds are going to correspond with, uh, import there's important information about these winds here, here, and here. This is your wind speeds with height. This is a way to see if your winds are backing or veering with height. We're going to really dive into each of these boxes in just one second. And this is your hodograph. We're really going to dive into it as well. There's a lot to take in. Let's talk about winds, wind shear, and what you can glean from uh, these four areas here, okay? So here you do see the winds rising and veering with height. Remember, veering is winds turning out of the west. When I talk about backing, that means winds are coming further, uh, gradually out of the east or more out of the east. So here you see surface winds are backed out of the south southeast at about 10 knots. Then you go up gradually from there and you see winds are veering generally with height all the way up and then somewhere about right here, about 500, they don't veer as much with height, okay? So let's talk about this box right here, which, uh, you know, it looks like a bunch of colored lines, different, uh, honestly, different lengths, that sort of thing. This is your wind speeds with height. This is a very useful thing because remember, if you've watched other videos of ours, directional shear and speed shear. This would be directional. This is speed. Speed shear is important. You need winds increasing with height for supercells. That's an important thing. So ideally, you'd want to see your winds gradually getting longer as you go up into the atmosphere. That's what creates good tilted up drafts for supercells. So a couple of notes in this box. You're going to see uh, that these colors here correspond with colors in the hodograph. You see there's a pink, there's a red, there's a green, there's yellow, and there's this blue color, cyan blue, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to call it blue, I think, for the rest of this lesson, just because it's easier to say. So here you can see this pink represents 0 to 1 kilometers. Red represents 1 to 3 kilometers. Green is 3 to 6. Yellow is 6 to 9. And blue is 9 to 15 kilometers. This is these all represent different layers in the atmosphere. They're all kind of important. Zero to three kilometers here is actually generally very important for supercell development, tornado development, all those things. We really own in on this area right here for storm mode. It's a pretty important area for that. And then gradually as you go up, there's also things to look at. We're going to really dive uh, into speed its relationship with direction and with some real world examples and future slides. So let's just, hopefully we'll be able to explain this a little better as we go forward. This inferred temperature advection. Why is this important? Well, if you see the red, that means the inferred temperature advection of the winds at this height 
mean that the air is warming versus blue, which, you know, would indicate cooling. And why this is important, red would indicate winds are veering at that level. Blue would indicate winds are backing because if the air is gradually cooling, it tends to cause winds to back or turn further out of the east. With supercells, you want this to be a really kind of a gradually veering type of thing. You want to have winds veering with height. So having blue in a sounding is a little bit harmful for supercells, depending on how much and how uh, big the bar is. You know, you see here 5.2, if you saw a negative 5.2 or something, that would indicate some pretty substantial backing in that layer. This is a good way just to see how with height your winds are veering or backing. It's a really great tool. We'll talk about it a little bit in future slides as well. So now we get to the hodograph. If you have watched our intro, Hodographs 101, you've kind of already got how this is plotted. But here's a real world example, and I want to briefly explain what's going on here, then explain other pieces, and then hopefully, 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 you'll kind of have a good picture of it and we can move on to some examples, okay? So to start, this is the center. To consider this the center of the plot. You see the, these concentric circles out, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, etc. That denotes wind speed. And then when you're talking about wind direction, it's backwards. This is a back because you're looking top down and inverted sort of. So think about it where, where winds are blowing to and not where they're blowing from. So if a wind is blowing out of the south at 20 knots, you're going to be up here. It's, it's up. You know, you're used to seeing south as down, but south is actually up. Same thing for a direction. You have an east wind at 10 knots, it would be over here. So, so think about this as southeast, then you have northeast, northwest, southwest. Okay, does that make sense? Hopefully so. I hope so, at least. So when you're talking about these lines, this line right here, this is your winds with height. You're going to be able to match it, these winds as they go up, are going to be able to be matched with this line. So say at the surface, you have a south wind at 10 knots. You see a south-southeast wind at 10 knots. You can see from here, south-southeast wind, bam, there's your surface plot. You have started. And you can see, again, how this color changes with height. Pink is 0 to 1. Red is 1 to 3. 3 to 6. 6 to 9. 9 to 15. See, it's pretty easy, actually. And then you have these other pieces right here. I'm going to have you focus on one thing just for simplicity's state, sake this time. Only because if we're chasing, we're looking for supercells, we're looking for right movers. So this dot right here, the round red dot is your storm motion, right motion, is your right motion. So... It's, a, it's your storm would be moving at 233 degrees, 26 knots. That's your storm motion. That's where it would be heading. From here, it's heading this way. Get it? Okay. One final note, just because there are going to be people that wonder about this. These four boxes down here, don't worry about them. Not for this lesson, at least, but one note, because it's kind of a pet peeve of mine. If a lot of people who don't really understand this box right here, potential hazard type, it's only useful if you can put it in context of a day. So if something says PDS tour, but you're going to have a line of storms, who cares? Like it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of other things that go into getting a big tornado environment. So don't worry about what this says so much if you're just starting out because it's not going to really get you to a good conclusion about the potential of a day. Okay, can we call that fair? Good. Now, with that said, let's look at some real world examples to hopefully put all this into practice, okay? Okay, you can see in this example, the winds are weak. Look at this, there's nothing above 20 knots all the way beyond 500 millibars. 500 millibars is kind of considered the middle point of the atmosphere, the mid-levels, and anything above that you get in the upper levels. When you have no real winds up to beyond 500, okay, that's a pretty big problem. Another thing uh, that you can see with that is that all these bars are so tiny, and then finally you see the winds increase with speed, and they start 
Yes, that's crazy. And then again, you see winds are generally backing with height through the whole atmosphere. You need This isn't a supercell environment. You need winds increasing with speed with height and veering with height, and you have no winds with height, and you have winds backing with height. Not a supercell environment. So you see this photograph is has no curvature to it. There's zero curvature. It just looks like a straight line with scribbles. It's all centered kind of here in the middle. Oh, there's just not much here. There's not. There, there's not much to look at. This kind of a photograph, when you see this, is going to result most likely in either single cells or some very weak multi cells. There's not much wind shear. You can see winds really pick up with height in the upper atmosphere. So if you could get this uh, sounding to destabilize, it, the odds of getting anything meaningful out of this other than maybe some small, marginally severe hell and wind gust, very low, okay? But, okay, now this one's an interesting one, huh? Because you can see over here, you, you start getting some of that curvature. There's some curving going on. You have a, but you have a storm motion here that's kind of denoted as southwest at 12 knots. That's a, uh, that's a little strange. Uh, so, yeah, so, um, yeah, not, not looking so good. Uh, so if you head over back over here, you have some really good low level winds. Look at this zero to one kilometers. There's some nice veering winds with height. They're pretty strong. And, you know, that, that looks really good. But then you start getting up here in the upper atmosphere and your winds are like going calm or in the middle layers. Your winds are going calm as you get up here before, again, increasing with height out of the northwest, west-northwest. So you see, again, you know, veering, veering, veering. There's some backing right here. It's calm. That's just like, that's not so great. And then you get up here and you see winds are backing with height. They're gradually, you know, coming back out of the east pretty strong though but yeah I mean you could I mean I, I I would say with a sounding like this unless you got some ginormous cape this looks like a multi-cell type of thing to me maybe you could get a very brief supercell kind of a uh, mixed mode of storm so to speak but not really what you're looking for. This isn't what you're looking for for supercells. Uh, generally, you know, you need winds increasing with height. You need them gradually veering with height. Neither one of those are actually present, really. There's some good low-level turning, that sort of thing. Maybe, you know, on if you're dealing with a large amount of instability, a boundary or something like that, such as a sea breeze, you can look for, you know, different things uh, like that. So let's take a look at another example. Okay. Now we're talking, right? This is looking better in terms of wind shear. Generally, right? Because generally you see winds are increasing with height. Generally, there is a weakness here in that uh, three to six kilometer range before they start increasing. But winds are generally veering. There's only some very slight backing and it's way up in the upper atmosphere. And down here in the low levels, you see there is some really, with this veering, there's some pretty strong winds. And you see it here. Now the south, southeast, you know, 15 knots, you see this big curving photograph all the way to three kilometers. But then you see this kind of, yeah, weakness. It starts getting a little weak, that sort of thing then goes off. This is definitely a supercell sounding because you do have this big cur curvature here. Now, this is also, this is the type of thing you would look for. Also, I want to own in on another thing, and that is uh, critical angle. You're going to see this pop up. Generally, this is a, not a hard and fast rule, but look for something closer to 90 degrees. That's usually a really good sign. We're going to have to get a guest lesson in here to really dive into critical angle because there are people who are geniuses with that and could explain it in ways that I couldn't even begin to do it justice with, but you want closer to 90, so 89 is pretty good with that number. Okay, now this one, again, pretty interesting. Uh, you have bat veering with height, winds are increasing with height. Uh, then you have here, you can see the photograph, there's hooking, and it's kind of, there's a little bit of an S shape here, which indicates there's some veer back in the sounding. 
but it's really generally really strong winds. It's continually moving out and away. This is a good sounding for supercells, actually. There is some strong beer backing, though, here on about the 700 millibar level. So this is like borderline where I would start getting worried. But there's not much turning. I mean, really, though, you get down to it. This is still pretty straight. There's some curvature, but it's, it's generally somewhat straighter compared to something that would, you know, loop around like this and then head out. So... This is a this is the type of thing you'll see in Dixie a lot. This is a Dixie sounding where, you know, it's a it's the without the massive amount of shear or directional shear here, you do end up in a situation I think where this ends up growing exponentially into a line. But if you do get supercells out ahead of it, there's a lot of low level shear here due to the curvature, you know, looking good. Okay, now. Let's talk about this one. This one, again, very quickly, you see winds veering with height, or winds increasing with height. Winds are veering, but then they're backing, and then they're veering again. You can see that in starting about 500 or so. And you can see, you know, once you start getting to the green here in the, um, excuse me, the three to six kilometer, and then even into six to nine. And you can see that. You can see how you have this nice veering, and then, with height and then they start gradually backing and you see this photograph take on this gradual s shape it's a bigger one but it is still an s shape but at the same time it's pretty good zero to three kilometer lots of speed i mean anytime you see it really drawn out like that that's a pretty good sign you have a lot of good low level shear this is a definite supercell environment. I mean, you're chasing this every time, and yeah, looks good. So uh, here's another one, one final example here before we're done. You can see, you know, veering, backing, veering, backing, you know, that's, and you can see with that, there's a lot of low level curvature here. You can see how they're veering before they start kind of backing. There's a lot of low level curvature, but then it just says all scribbly. What's going on? Generally, my general rule with these is that anytime you see a photograph that looks scribbly, expect messy storm modes. Even if you got this curvature and you get like these weird transient supercells that then turn into multi cells and line segments, but then super, there's other supercells, it's messy. This is a messy storm mode because it just looks like someone's been scribbling. So, generally, when we're talking about this again, this is another. This day would be another example. It just gets all scribbly and wonky here. You could definitely get, you know, a supercell, but it would be a weird, messy thing. The day is going to evolve messy generally, and here you can see how that isn't the case. And again, if you had that a lot of cape, you would have a pretty, you know, it's pretty predictable. You'd have a supercell in that environment. So as long as you know what to look for in this, you would really have a good shot at succeeding with you know your in terms of anticipating storm mode so in conclusion the you know the things i would say you want to look for are winds increasing with height you want to kind of have veering with height generally up up the ladder here and then here you want to have this curvature with uh some nice curvature all the way up that sort of thing and if you can have that, you're going to have supercells. And then, you know, there's a lot of complexity. Will there be tornadoes, that sort of thing? We're not touching on that here. We're kind of just dealing with storm mode. So I hope this was helpful. I hope you found it educational. This is kind of a long-winded way of explaining that right there. And, yeah, let me know uh, what you think. Let me know if you have any questions. Maybe we can answer them in future videos. Hope to do more forecast videos in the future. So like and subscribe, comment, do all those things. We'll see you next time.